there too. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Brent Lemire. I'm chair of the Board of Selectmen. And I'm, all I'm going to do is uh, do the legal part here um, and read the notice for public hearing. An issuance of bonds or notes in excess of $100,000. Pursuant to the provisions of the Municipal Finance Act, RSA 33, the Litchfield Board of Selectmen hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing on January 11, 2018 at the Campbell High School Auditorium, One Highlander Court, Litchfield, New Hampshire, to discuss the proposed issuance of a bond or note that will exceed $100,000. Said hearing will commence immediately following the Budget Committee Town School Budget Hearings, scheduled to start at 7 o'clock p.m. The proposed bond or note is for constructing and equipping a new fire station building and all related activities necessary for said construction and to borrow in the name of the municipality by issuance of serial notes or bonds a sum not to exceed $5,500,000. Residents wishing to speak on this matter are invited to attend and I welcome you here tonight and we're going to have a presentation. I'm going to turn it over to the fire chief, uh, Chief Freitzel. Good evening. Thank you, Chairman Lemire. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is uh, go through a presentation uh, on the stage with us this evening uh, are obviously members of the Board of Selectmen, uh, members of the uh, construction management uh, firm that's been retained by the town, Ekman Construction, and uh, I'll, I'll invite uh, Preston Hunter up shortly uh, to uh, introduce his staff as well as uh, Jonathan Howley from Warren Street Architects, who has been the uh, the architect uh, of record for uh, uh, well over 10 years, almost uh, close to two decades on the fire station project. So they have, uh, Jonathan has considerable history with uh, this project as it's been proposed over the years. So what we would like to cover tonight is uh, why is a new station needed, what is being proposed, project costs, project financing, uh, and then a question and answer period. So. Um, I, I, I am going to kind of go through a little quicker. We did present this the other night. Um, I, I'm going to kind of move through the why do we need the station um, and then spend a little bit more time on what's being proposed and actually kind of explain each, each component of the station so that uh, um, you have a better understanding. There are handouts out in the back. They're uh, eight and a half by 14 legal size. It's a copy of the site plan on one side, and then on the back side is actually a schematic diagram of the proposed station um, with, with rooms and so forth labeled. So they're on the chair on uh, my left, your right in the back, and on the counter uh, on, on the right-hand side, your left-hand side. So I would invite you, if you don't have one, to grab one. It will be probably a little easier than trying to read the diagram once we get to it uh, up on the screen. Uh, the current fire station was built in 1959 by volunteers. Uh, the, the lumber to build the station was actually milled off the piece of property at 257 Charles Bancroft. Um, and at the time, basically the fire department then responded to fires and medical calls. Um, and, and in contrast, today we, we are more of an all hazards department responding to technical type rescues, responding to um, violent incidents and, and, and unfortunately in this day and age that we have to but we do, we do much more now than just go to fires actually our fires are down um, because of technologies and, and uh, advancements in technologies uh, there's been two additions to the station over the years uh, as you look at this you're looking um, towards the north side of the building the original station um, was was basically the peak roof uh, would be to the left uh, of the building. The second addition um, on the picture on the right, the second addition ended just about behind that one uh, uh, between those two trucks. And then the third addition, which was uh, in 1979, was that last uh, bay door, which actually drives straight through to the north side of the building or the church cemetery side of the building. Uh, and that bay was constructed in order to have space to house the, uh, the town's first custom fire truck that actually sat more than two firefighters. Um, at the time the station was built in the 50s, uh, in the early 60s, there was approximately 12 volunteer firefighters. 
Uh, currently, the, we have a full roster of right around 38 um, firefighters, uh, and EMTs, emergency medical technicians. Uh, there's two full-time firefighters. The town went to two full-time firefighters back in 1985. Still have them today. Two part-time uh, personnel. Uh, my position is the fire chief is a part-time position, as well as we have a, a part-time fire inspector. And then the rest of the department is comprised of approximately 34 on-call firefighters. And an on-call firefighter doesn't live at the station, doesn't work routinely at the station. They carry a pager. Um, or they get a text message on their phone when there's an emergency and they respond from home, from work, wherever they may be to the fire station to staff the apparatus and then respond to the incident. <coughs> uh, currently we run about 55% of our calls are medical and as I indicated earlier, we do fire, medical, hazardous materials and, and a multitude of different type of uh, incidents. Uh, this, this station that you see in front of you currently houses um, five pieces of equipment, uh, three engines, a tanker, and our rescue. Uh, each one has kind of specific roles, but are all, for the most part, can fill in other roles as well. We additionally have uh, eight pieces of equipment that sit outside, most of it at the fire station. However, during the winter time, we do move some back to the, um, we move some, excuse me, up to the highway garage just so that it's not in the way for plowing. Here you see in the picture on the right our forestry um, unit and uh, our utility unit, which has a plow on it that, that remain at the station pretty much year round. And then currently at, at the highway garage, we have a larger forestry unit, which is on loan to us from the state of New Hampshire. We have our boat, uh, we have our light tower, and then not in any of these pictures, it's kind of parked over behind the, the old town hall is the special operations trailer, which has our off-road vehicle, which can do both medical and as well as forestry incidents. Uh, when the station was originally built, population was, you know, was a lot less, um, and, and there's been significant increases um, in, the, in the years um, since then. Back in 1959, they did approximately 40 calls a year. Um, and, and now, last year, we did 653 requests for emergency uh, response. That does not include inspections, um, fire prevention activities, fire prevention details, public education, or any of that. That's purely um, 911 or, or urgent type response incidences uh, in 2017. We've also seen a tremendous growth in, in the school. Uh, students, obviously the school, good school district draws additional students uh, and that was actually one of the reasons the town went to full-time coverage in 1985 was uh, because of the growth in the schools and, and to have staff available during the day while the students are in school. We've also added some schools um, since then. Uh, obviously as a, with growth of the schools, we've, um, our, our um, well, we protect grows, um, and I'm actually going to, Deputy Nickel looked up, what was the total? So currently, and it kind of a, a little bit of an interesting and almost staggering fact, but the deputy did the research, $840 million is what we, uh, in town assessed value, is what we protect with an with a on-call fire department, which is pretty impressive, I must say. And we have a very active on-call fire department. Um, which, which is not um, entirely common. I know a lot of my colleagues in and around the state um, struggle to retain and, and recruit call and volunteer firefighters. So we're fortunate. We, we haven't really had that issue. We've always maintained our roster. So, As I indicated earlier, back in the um, 50s and early 60s, there were approximately 40 calls or 40 emergencies a year. And uh, in 2017, we did 653, so pretty significant growth over the years, all out of the same building. The current fire station, while built, um, when it was built back in the 50s, um, and, and I don't go back that far, and I'm not going to claim to, so, um, was really where the growth or where the, where the uh, population was on Charles Bancroft Highway. Um, the, the, the more eastern, central and eastern parts of town really weren't as grown up as they are today. Uh, the, the picture on the slide kind of shows the, the pockets or neighborhoods of, of growth since then, which really are, are, are at a distance from the current station. Um, 
and while we can we can hit everything on Charles Bancroft in a reasonable amount of time, our goal is to be on have the apparatus from from the time of leaving the station to the time on scene somewhere in the four to six minute range, um, and that's that's a little challenge now. Um, National Regional Planning did um, the the maps that you see for us and, and based it on the average speed speed limits, distance, and so forth, uh, and the shadings all indicate minutes. Uh, by each minute, one, two, three, and so on, out to I think it's nine minutes, um, what our response would be from the current station, and then we'll get into one um, shortly that will show you from the proposed station, which is proposed on Liberty Way right next to Town Hall. Um, I would indicate, as I mentioned, it's a little hard to see up here, but if you go to the website that's been created, litchfieldfirestation.com, uh, you can click on the map on the page and it'll blow it right up. You can zoom into where your home is, look at the, the shade of the color, look at the legend and be able to tell what our current response time is and what our proposed response time would be. Uh, back in late 2015, um, the Board of Selectmen commissioned uh, a feasibility study of the current fire station to look at um, its, its capabilities as, as it relates to the current um, operation of the fire department to look at its compliance with current codes, life safety codes, building codes, structural codes, and, and um, ADA compliance. Um, Jonathan Howey from Warren Street uh, and his firm um, handled that, and I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan in a few minutes to speak to that. Um, but I had a couple more slides I want to go through before we do that. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have equipment that's parked outside. This, this kind of gives you a representative idea of what sits outside year-round. The picture on the right is the forestry vehicle that is currently at highway. Uh, and you may say we don't use the forestry vehicles during the winter because of the snow. We actually do because they're all-wheel drive vehicles. We do use them during the winter. We'll use them to go out and, and respond to a wires down call or a tree across the road so that we're not tying up a larger uh, more valuable piece of equipment uh, as well as these vehicles are all-wheel drive and they tend to get around a lot better in the snow uh, than our, than our uh, typical size fire apparatus which are not all-wheel drive. Uh, existing, actually I'm going to turn it over to you now John for existing conditions and so forth. Um, my name is Jonathan Holly. I'm with Warren Street Architects. I've been involved with um, the Litchfield Fire Station proposal now since 2004. Um, and I just want to start by saying that um, the proposals that uh, the original design in 2004 and as it progressed to the proposal in 2008 and then again now to 2018, um, I have those plans up here for anybody in the audience that would like to see them after the, after the meeting. Um, they are um, extremely comparable um, so they're here um, in uh, in 2004 I just want to go back for a brief second um, we designed a station that was a five bay station it was scaled back to be three bays with an addition um, um, and it was to be located on a parcel on the corner of Albuquerque and Woodhawk Way um, that was conceived as a second station to the to the existing in 2008, we were asked to further refine that design, which was a five bay station, and that proposal was moved to the town hall lot, uh, adjacent to the town hall. Um, in all of the Warren articles since 2008, the building has remained. Um, it's a 5B wood construction. It has a concrete block, garage bays, asphalt shingle roof, vinyl siding, um, with, with very simple, modest interiors. The materials in 2018 um, are the same as that proposed in 2004, but I just want people to understand that from 2004 and 2008 to today, building codes and energy codes have changed. So the, 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 the envelope of the building, if you will, that was proposed um, more than, uh, well, back to 2004, we could not build today. So there are advances that have been made that are documented in these drawings that increase the energy efficiency and the tightness of the envelope of the building. The mechanical and electrical systems are much higher efficiency. Um, so there are improvements um, that have been made to that, to that design that was originally conceived back in 2004. 
In 2016, we were asked to do this existing conditions feasibility study. Um, the conclusion of that study was that the existing site where the fire station is today could, could accommodate a maximum build out of 8,000 square feet. Um, 8,000 square feet is less than the programmatic need of the fire station today. The existing station, um, uh, the existing station is more than 50 years old. It was built by volunteers. Um, it's in a location that is not the optimal in terms of uh, minimized response times to where the population is today. The existing structure is very difficult to renovate. And I'm just going to go through a couple of things so that, um, in terms of the existing structure. The, the existing building is a concrete block on a, on a, uh, on a masonry on a, on a masonry and concrete foundation. It's unreinforced block. It's filled with vermiculite and asbestos. It's very difficult to extract that from the block in terms of renovating because of how it was constructed. The garage space and the business space that is in, on the second floor um, by code today needs to be separated with a rating. Um, and because of the structure of, of how it's built today, it's very difficult to provide that rating and to provide that separation. In addition to all of that, um, there is no fire alarm, there are no exit devices, there is no two means of legal egress out of the second floor. Um, the fire escape on the outside is no longer allowed by building code. Um, the interior stair is non-compliant. It's not rated, it's not enclosed. So there is no legal means of egress from the second floor um, that is used for administration. There's no handicap accessibility to the building. Um, um, and, and the site itself is in conflict with, with its shared use of the church and the historic commission. Um, today, when we did design an emergency um, uh, response building, if you will, we look very closely at how traffic patterns occur, and we try to isolate how the public and emergency vehicles um, conflict. And traffic is a real concern here, and the potential for conflict and an accident is, is very real. Um, when we completed the, the feasibility study, we used the comparison tool. We took um, in terms of the, uh, the expenses that were estimated for the renovation of the building, um, we took um, the only estimate that we had at that time, which was done in 2004, prorated it forward with escalation, and, and um, with the understanding that those numbers didn't include any additional space that would be required once we sat down and talked about the uses today. It didn't include furniture, fixture, and equipment. It didn't include site, um, uh, site costs at that time. It didn't include the upgraded electrical mechanical systems, a generator, dealing with the communication tower that Chief will talk about. Um, it didn't include the owner-provided tell data and the moving costs and all of those other things. So um, when, we, when we completed the feasibility study, the premium between renovating um, and providing an ina inadequate uh, station and the proposal um, to build that same s footprint somewhere else was about an $800,000 premium. Based on that, the selectmen voted to move forward with designing um, a new station on the lot adjacent to the town hall. Um, so what we did is we took the 2004 design, um, which is essentially the same as the 2008 being five bays, um, and we applied today's standards to it. Um, one of the things that we did right off the bat is between 2008 and, and today, the standards in firefighting, um, the firefighter's gear is no longer stored in the apparatus base, and it comes back with carcinogens and things that need to be vented directly to the outside. So the, the standard today is to provide a separate room off to the side where gear is stored, not in the apparatus base, is separately vented to the outside. That increased the size of the building about 1,000 square feet. Um, and from the proposal in 2004, which was for only three bays, when we went to five bays, it's about a 25% increase in, in total size. Um, the second thing is that we were asked by the Board of Selectmen to, to review and consider 
um, this proposal to accommodate a future police station so that it would be a public safety complex. Um, so what we did is we, um, we looked, we expanded the site. Um, we have sited the fire station in such a way that a, an addition could be placed in the future to accommodate the police department. Um, we, by doing that, we were forced to deal with a bigger site and provide more stormwater management for the, lar for the larger site disturbance. Um, we've provided conduit from the fire station to the police station to the town hall, so there's connectivity. Um, we've, uh, we included a full house generator, if you will, that provides emergency power to uh, the firehouse that uh, was not previously um, planned for. Um, and, and we've accommodated and planned for the relocation of the communications tower that the chief will speak to in a minute, um, which is another peripheral that, that hadn't been addressed previously. Um, I spoke briefly about upgrades in building code. Um, this proposal that is, that is on the table today um, incorporates an upgraded building envelope that meets the energy codes that are required today. Um, we have redesigned the core of the administration area so that in the future, should the police department addition um, come to fruition, um, there could be shared services. So the, the um, electrical mechanical rooms could be shared, the bathrooms potentially could be shared, the emergency operating um, operations center training room could be shared. That EOC training room actually has private access from the outside so that it could be used by the general public without having access to both the fire station and the police station. Um, in the redesign of the building, we've upgraded power and lighting um, to meet current standards. Uh, the mechanical HVAC systems um, have been upgraded to high efficiency boilers. There's radiant heat in the, in the fire apparatus bays which dry the floors and actually provide a better heat and it's actually a, a cheaper way to heat that particular space um, and better for the fire equipment itself. Um, you're going to see that in the bond we've included furniture, fixtures and equipment. Um, we've talked about uh, the disposition of the existing building and that there is some value as to whether or not it be reused in some other way or be sold. Um, and one of the bigger issues in terms of of studying a renovation of the building versus building new. The new proposal allows that there's no impact on the fire uh, department itself while this is being done. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Preston or, or Frank. Thank you, John. I'm going to go through a few more. So you've kind of heard the, the building uh, limitations and so forth. What I'd like to cover now is kind of the operational side of um, the challenges we have. Um, as you can see, there's, there's direct access um, to the building. There's, there's, you know, as trucks are pulling out, people could be coming in and it's very tight quarters. Uh, as you can see here, uh, on, the outside, on the north and south side of the building, uh, we actually can't open the doors to the fire apparatus all the way because there's not enough room between the truck and the wall. Um, and, and while it may look fairly easy for that fire department to get in dressed in their street clothes, when you add about 40 pounds of gear to them and bulk them up a little bit, it makes that a little bit of a, uh, a tight squeeze to get in. Uh, you can see gear hanging in the middle picture, gear hanging along the wall. Uh, somebody could be bent over putting gear on as that truck starts moving because they're out of view of the, of the operator uh, in their blind spot on the mirror. Um, so these are some of the operational challenges. Um, as, as John mentioned, it's a shared lot. This is uh, you know, some of the challenges we face. The, the church is very good to work with, and, and I'll get into that even more in a second. But it depends on what's going on at the church. If there's a large funeral or, or something else going on, it, it can make it a challenge to struggle for the approximately 40 parking spots that are there. Um, this is actually uh, a fairly recent picture. It was after a significant fire um, early, well, last winter now at this point, just about a year ago. Um, it was, uh, the hose is sitting there um, uh, basically thawing out. The ladder that's on the floor had to be brought back fully extended because it froze in, in position. Um, and all this has to go back on the truck. And you can see from the picture here 
that um, that's an average size firefighter laying on the top of the truck and they barely have enough room to squeeze under the ceiling. There's no way to reload this hose in the building. So after a fire in two degree weather with 20 to 30 mile an hour winds and a wind chill well below zero, all this hose had to be put back on the truck outside in the dark uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, really not a safe thing for our firefighters. They're cold, they're tired, they're wet, uh, and, and that's when accidents you know, tend to happen and, and we really don't want that for our people. Um, some of the structural concerns John referenced earlier. Um, this bottom picture, um, right up, right in here, that's actually the center post that supports the center of the fire station. There's some crumbled um, block and so forth. So there are structural issues as well. Um, that, that's the ceiling in the fire apparatus. And I'm going to jump ahead here. And, and what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time um, on this slide. And if you flip to here, if you go to the schematic side, what I'd like to actually do is kind of run down what's going to be in this proposed building. Um, and I'm going to start and kind of go across here and then just work this way all the way across so that you can follow along. Um, so from, from the top left side of the slide um, are, three are two offices and a conference room, deputy fire chief, uh, conference room in between that and the fire chief's office, and then just under that is a hallway that connects everything. And then going back again to the left side of the slide is uh, a kitchen. Uh, the kitchen may look a little bit bigger. That's kind of the, the, the heart um, the heart and soul of, the fire, of a firehouse is the kitchen. All the world's problems get solved at the kitchen table um, each day. Same problems get solved day in, day out. Um, but it's also built for, for a couple, a little bit bigger for a couple reasons. One, as John said, so that we could support a future a growth of a police station and have shared facilities. These are the core facilities on this corner of the building that we would be able to share by co-locating um, a, a police station attached to Basically, this, this area right in here would be the, would be the uh, uh, site for a future police station. So we could share that kitchen. Um, that kitchen is also would be set up to support the emergency operations center, the community room, the training room, uh, and so forth. Uh, cooling and warming shelters as needed um, would be in that large room at the bottom. Um, so it, is, it looks maybe a little bit bigger, but it, it, it's, it's not oversized, but it's, it's posed for a little bit of growth and, and not just, you know, the two full-timers that are there. I mean, on average, we have six people respond to a call, so it's not uncommon to have six or so people, you know, after a call, sitting down, taking a break or whatever, um, or even just, we, we're fortunate, our, our folks like to come in and just kind of hang out, if you will, um, so that they're there if something happens or they may be, you know, working on little projects or whatever so that that's kind of again as I said in a, in a firehouse the kitchen's kind of the heart and soul. Uh, moving across there we have uh, a uh, mechanical uh, room uh, and an electrical closet and then again continuing horizontally across uh, EMS office EMS room um, no different than a doctor's office we fall under HIPAA requirements for confidentiality patient information security and so forth um, we, have, we have reporting requirements on every medical call we go on. We have to submit a report to the state. While most of it's done electronically, we do at times get signatures or take you know, notes or, or fill out forms that we transfer information to the ambulance from Hudson when they come. All that stuff needs to be secured um, in, in accordance with um, guidelines and regulations and, and HIPAA laws and so forth. So that's where that would be, that would work, that would be. Um, moving again across um, a records and file room. Um, one of the things that's not often planned for is having files, building files, fire permit files, all that stuff. So there's a records and file room. Uh, moving across again, an officer center, kind of an area for officers to do reports. All our officers tend to carry some, or our first line supervisors carry some other uh, responsibilities, as you heard earlier in the town's um, presentation, uh, town, the town has implemented a merit performance system. That includes our call firefighters. They are evaluated annually. Their increases are based on their annual evaluation. 
So this is an area where an officer or supervisor can sit down with a firefighter and actually conduct a, a personnel meeting, be it a, a um, evaluation or a counseling session or on a rare occasion a disciplinary meeting. Uh, that's, that's what this office would allow for. Um, next room is, as John referred to, the gear room. Um, now gear is out amongst the apparatus. Uh, over the last really five years or so, uh, many studies have been done and, and, and have indicated that the protective clothing that we wear when we go into a fire is our biggest enemy. It's our biggest protector, but it's our biggest enemy. Because everything that is in that environment, smoke, soot, gases, all collect on that gear. And when we come back, we need to wash it and clean it. And, and despite how much we wash and clean it, you can never get it all out. So the, 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 the new best practices are it's in a room that has its own HVAC. It's directly vented, as John indicated, directly vented to the outside so that those, you know, airborne whatevers are, are constantly being drawn out and, and not commingled with the rest of the heating system, with the rest of the air conditioning, and, and dispersed back into the building. But basically, it's, it's, it's still safe to wear, but it's still got what we call off-gassing. So that's what that room would be. And that room is, is designed to hold 40 sets of 40 gear lockers. Um, and and it, they were, gear lockers were kind of shown on the picture as you came in the door, but gear lockers, I think, are 22 inches, 22, 24 inches wide. And that's where their helmet, their coat, their boots, their pants, their gloves, everything they need to go to either a structural fire or a brush fire, that's each, each firefighter has a gear locker. Um, and so we want to make sure we build this to, so that each firefighter has a gear locker. We no longer um, encourage or even really allow firefighters to carry the gear in the back seat of their car because as I indicated earlier it, it's really a hazard that's the same back seat that tomorrow morning they're going to go put their their son or daughter into to take them to school so we discourage that gear needs to stay at the station we actually decon our personnel with with a hose line gross decon them before we even bring them back to the station now so we minimize the impact on the trucks that's how serious we've taken seriously we've taken this based on the studies that have been done nationwide um, and we're not alone. Every other department is moving to this as well. So uh, going back down over to here, um, that larger room is a uh, training room, uh, emergency, a townwide emergency operations center, and a community room. Uh, as John indicated, it, it's uh, the way it's designed, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the, um, the Lions Club, the senior, center, senior citizens, whoever could come meet, it's independent from the fire station, so it's not, a, there's no, not an issue with somebody having to be there to let them in. Um, it's designed to have electronic locking so that if, if the, um, the, the, the Boy Scouts are meeting at 7 o'clock on a night, the doors can un, un, automatically unlock at quarter of 7 and relock at 10 o'clock so that there's really nobody, there's, there's a bathroom attached to it so that there's no issue there's a bathroom and then access to the kitchen if it's needed can be can be uh, accommodated uh, this room will seat 40 with tables and chairs so in a for a training type setup or approximately 80 if it's just chairs for a setup similar to what we're we're in right now um, smaller rooms off those are um, a uh, a storage room to store training equipment or store the tables if we're doing chairs only up here and then a janitor's closet that actually opens into the hallway that traverses the building laterally moving to the right I mentioned there's a lobby foyer area that's the main entrance of the station which is right down here and again this is the Albuquerque Ave of, um, side of the building there's a bathroom which is is basically in the unsecured part of the building open to the public open to whoever's using the community room um, and then there is uh, a storage area for photocopier, paper, office supplies, that type of stuff, small area, an IT closet for all the, uh, the um, technology and computer um, stuff. Um, moving across, men's and women's room um, with both, ba um, obviously, toilets and so forth, but a shower, sink, and then the space to have a small 12 inch by 12 inch or 14 by 14 inch locker for each firefighter 
so that they can keep a change of clothes and some toiletries so that if they get that dirty, they can shower before they get in their car and go home and take whatever they got into home to their, to their family. So um, again, a proactive step towards the, the direction the fire service has gone uh, over the last 20 years, but more, more specifically the last five years. Uh, moving across, going towards the bays, a medical equipment storage room. Um, we store um, replacement disposable consumable medical equipment for, for calls we go on that need to be restocked on the truck. We store medications um, that, that to restock a truck. Most of our stuff comes from the hospital or we exchange with the ambulance, but we do have some medications. Um, this is a clean environment. I won't say sterile, but um, compared to the kitchen cabinets that all that stuff is in right now upstairs, this is a much more sterile environment. Uh, but it's also secured so we can track who goes in and out. Uh, our rescue carries narcotics, so we fall under federal DEA guidelines for the storage and security of narcotics. So if we have to take the truck and, and send it out for service, we have to have an area we can secure the narcotics and only those that are licensed to utilize them have access to them. So that would be that that would be um, con this room and contained within this room. And we actually have to have two two locking methods. Can't be just be one lock on narcotics. It has to be a minimum of two, and it has to be trackable. So it has to be electronic or or, or other methods. Uh, and we currently do it now on the apparatus, uh, but we have nowhere. If we have to take the truck out, um, we have to come up with a way to either return it to the pharmacy or the paramedic has to literally hold on to it while that truck's out of service, which is not a good thing either. Either, excuse me. And then the last room before we get to the bays is a, it's labeled drying. That's where the protective clothing um, dryer would go. The washer I'll get to in a second. Uh, but we have a, a washer dryer a washer extractor, so it's a special piece of equipment. Looks like it looks like a conventional laundry mat, commercial washer, but it is actually designed specifically for firefighting prote firefighter protective clothing to wash and extract and so forth. That's not something we, we just purchased that within the last two years. That's not something that was part of the original plan. Um, that's a rather large machine and, and needs space, needs drainage and and, and power. Um, the drying. Um, that so we'd have a washroom, a dry room, and then across the hall, kind of systematically across the hall, back into the gear storage area. Um, right below the drying area is the washroom, and again, the drying room would also have a, a typical residential dryer for stuff that is not con not contaminated, uniforms that may get dirty because of working around the station, blankets, towels, stuff like that. So we actually have two different washing systems, but one is for contaminated and one is for non-contaminated. So there's also a bathroom, a decon area. If we have an incident, somebody, I guess let me go back and say, this kind of area right here, if you will, is kind of like the, the, the demilitarized zone in that fire pr uh, protective clothing does not go into this part of the building whatsoever under any circumstances. This is the clean part of the building. So that's why this is all set up right off the base. Get off the truck, get into the, get into the decon area, get the gear off, get the gear clean. If you need actually to, to, to take a shower right there because you're that dirty or contaminated, there is a shower there to, to handle that. Um, gear goes into the washer, you get a quick shower, then you, you, know, you kind of run into the other shower and get a true shower, get your change of clothes and so forth. Um, right below that, is uh, an SCBA workroom, our protective clothing, self-contained breathing apparatus. Um, we can't be working on that on the same bench. We just tuned the chainsaw up. Uh, we, ha we have a, a, a clean area to work on that. You'll see kind of like three small, three small boxes. That's a three bay sink because the way, the recommended way to clean is a pre-rinse, a soap wash and a rinse, kind of like doing dishes in a, in, a, in a restaurant. There's a procedure for washing our masks and so forth. Uh, also in that room is our, our, what we call a cascade system, but all the bottles we use to refill the individual air bottles, as well as the compressor that refills them, as well as the compressor that will provide basic air to the power tools and apparatus out on the apparatus bay. And then the last two rooms, 
right here in kind of in the middle on the bottom is a lobby reception area or radio communications area again tied somewhat close to the larger room or emergency operations center so that when we're working when the town staff selectman's rep a highway police we're all working in that planning for and, and planning ahead for a, a large incident be it an ice storm be it a flood or anything like that we have communications fairly close to the room as well it'll, as it'll be our day-to-day -day hub for regular radio communications uh, it also is big enough for uh, a future expansion or a, a receptionist or somebody maybe part-time full-time at some point down the road to be there to greet you when you come in as well as our inspectional services office right there behind that um, close to um, the public as they come in as we go in, out into the apparatus bay uh, basically the the equipment the town currently has is laid out within that building um, the the more primary more date equipment used day to day being closer to the to the administrative side of the building and then kind of spreading out as we go but you can see every single um, bay in that station has a piece of equipment that the town currently owns none of that equipment is proposed for the future um, so the question may be if the town at some point down the road opts to get its own ambulance where do we put it we would put it where the rescue is because right now the rescue goes to every medical call because we don't have an ambulance if the town were to were at some point to decide they want to run an ambulance then we would no longer need the rescue and it could go right in the rescues bay so there is space when the town chooses and I'm not advocating that that's coming um, with with the way things work right now I have no as the fire chief I have no intention to propose bringing an ambulance on board in in the foreseeable future we've got a very good arrangement and financial deal with the town of Hudson to provide the service um, and and when we get into it we couldn't we couldn't do it for what we're paying for right now even close we'd spend a lot of money to run our own ambulance um, all our people with the exception of maybe a half a dozen are medically trained so that rescue rolls out they're all EMTs advanced EMTs or even paramedics on that truck and that truck is carrying pretty much the rescue is carrying all the same equipment that's on the ambulance coming out of Hudson with the exception of the ability to transport to a hospital and maybe an IV pump but um, you're not going to use that in a first response um, environment anyway and the ambulance has it when it gets there so um, I, I guess I'll hold questions till later um, elevations of the new station so front back and and sides and then uh, project costs I will turn it over to uh, Preston Hunter from uh, Ekman construction and I take it at this point he'll introduce the team that has put this program together Thank you, Chief. Anyone else feel like they just got a PhD in fire station design? That was, that was a terrific walk through the floor plan. Um, again, my name is Preston Hunter. I'm the Vice President at Ekman Construction. We are a general contractor based out of Bedford, and uh, we are, as was mentioned earlier, acting as the construction manager for this project. Uh, just a quick moment on what a construction manager is and how we are connected with the project. Um, we were uh, brought on board through a competitive process. The town went out to a number of construction management firms in October, and uh, we were hired to work with the town to develop the cost estimate that's the basis for the construction portion of the project. After the project passes, Ekman will be responsible for competitively bidding all aspects of the project to qualified subcontractors. Those bids will be received and reviewed with town officials, selections will be made, and then Ekman will be responsible for overseeing and supervising all of the construction portion of the project to ensure that everything is completed in accordance with the plans and specifications. So uh, a little background on what we've done since we were hired in October. Um, in late November, uh, we received a complete set of documents from Warren Street Architects this was issued for pricing. Uh, this was a 66-page document set, which Jonathan has here as well, uh, including site design, architectural design, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, 
and it looks like I forgot structural, but structural was also part of that set. Um, we spent the next four weeks, roughly four weeks, pricing those documents. Uh, the first thing that we did was go through all of the plans, basically doing a coordination review. If there were any questions or any conflicts within the design, uh, our estimators contacted Warren Street Architects, asked a myriad of questions. Um, Jonathan said that we kept him pretty busy uh, with answering questions at the budget committee meeting on Tuesday, and that's really to ensure that we understand exactly what the design intent is. So when we went out to over 30 qualified subcontractors and suppliers to assist us with developing the costs for all of the different components of the building, we could answer their questions and ensure that the prices that we developed accurately reflected what was on the plans. Um, in addition to receiving input from uh, subcontractors and suppliers, we also use current pricing that uh, we have from other projects that are currently ongoing or recently bid uh, and applied those costs to the products and materials and the quantities that are shown on the plans. Um, when this process was completed in, in late December, we met with the town administrator and the fire chief to review uh, the scope and the pricing uh, to ensure that anything that was required for the project but was excluded from our costs were included on the owner's budget, also called the soft costs. These are typical items such as furniture, fixtures, equipment, um, communications uh, towers, and, uh, and there, there are many other items that also are included in that. So the, the goal there are to, in, to ensure that uh, all of the costs are accounted for and nothing is counted for more than once. So this process resulted in a, in a summary here, and we'll provide more information on the next slide uh, that break down the construction side of these costs. Uh, the building construction came to $4 million. The site work construction was $789,500. And the project soft costs, or the owner's costs, uh, were just under $680,000, and that brings uh, our, uh, the total project uh, value to five million four hundred sixty nine thousand uh, which I understand was uh, rounded to five point five for the purposes of the Warren article so at this point I'd like to invite John real our chief estimator to come up and join me LinkedIn told me just yesterday that John is celebrating 30 years at Ekman uh, and um, that qualifies him to come up and answer all of your hard questions uh, so I'll turn it over to you uh, thank you. Um, I just went through, as the President said, I'm the Chief Estimator with Ekman Construction. I've been doing this for 30 years. I think this is our eighth or ninth uh, safety sort of complex, whether it be police stations, ambulance facilities, uh, fire facilities. So I'm very familiar with, with pricing these sort of projects. So as he said, we took the set of documents that we had, we analyzed them, sent them out to get some subcontractor response, and price some of the stuff just based upon history. So I'll, be, I'll briefly run down through what, what's involved in each of the items. Uh, general conditions, um, that's basically the personnel that will be on the site running the project or in the office, whether it be project managers, superintendents, assistants, layout personnel, and that sort of stuff. Uh, general requirements, those are what we use on a daily basis in the job site to build the project, for instance, temporary electric, uh, temporary water services, trailers, those sorts of things. Uh, site work and landscaping, we actually had a, uh, a local uh, subcontractor that we do a fair amount of work with put, help us put the budget together on that. That really involves, that's your building excavation, your pavement areas, sidewalks, landscaping and fencing, and those sort of things go into that number. Um, really, the thought was that this whole thing was a two-phase project, so the drawing, I think there's a drawing, is there a drawing that we can? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So really what you see is basically it's a pretty simplified st uh, site project. Um, paving takes a huge amount of the areas. The darker green areas 
those are uh, drainage drainage uh, areas where basically you can't um, when you do a site any longer you can't just let the water run off the site you have to contain it within the site and treat it so that means that you have a lot of structures on site to be able to accommodate that to treat the water and then slowly release it um, the concrete is really a pretty simple frost wall um, which means a four foot five uh, four foot high wall insulated um, and the only truly tricky part of that whole thing is because of the shear considerations in your higher bay areas there's about 84 feet of 16 foot high concrete wall so that tends to be obviously more expensive than a four foot frost wall masonry basically your apparatus bay or where the trucks are going to be is all a block construction with the exception of the concrete that ties that whole thing together. Um, metals is basically bollards and angles around the doors and that sort of stuff that really create a more durable and also protect your structure from trucks possibly backing into areas and having steel around the jams protects that from happening also. Uh, rough carpentry, that's a big, uh, that's a big chunk as Jonathan said it's a wood frame construction basically all your office areas are wood framed and it's a wood truss truss system that runs across the whole project uh, finished carpentry that's um, basically limited to cabinets plastic laminate cabinets plastic laminate counters there's a little bit of trim for instance there's some a few door casings and a few aprons at windows but it's really a pretty simple finished carpentry project uh, the next item, caulking, weather barriers, damp proofing, and gutters. Those involve making your building weather tight. A weather barrier is really something that's come up over in the last few years that you now have to wrap the entire building so that there's a continuous insulated envelope. So that's something that wouldn't have been considered in previous iterations of the estimate. Uh, the foundations are all damp proof so that there's no water penetration. In, into the building and then gutters were really are something that's come up recently too because of that treatment of the water being able to treat it on site when it comes off the roof areas you have to be able to direct it to your structures so that it isn't running off the site so that's another thing that's um, that's critical um, insulation really where it's insulated the buildings insulated to current codes to meet current codes uh, roofing is just an asphalt shingle roof. Um, siding, it's all vinyl sided. Um, for the most part, there's two types of siding. There's a vertical siding and there's a shake siding. Um, doors, frames, hardware, that's really all your access points. It's a commercial type of steel frame with hardboard painted doors. So it's, uh, it's a pretty fundamentally um, simple sort of door construction. Uh, Electronic hardware is, uh, or excuse me, I skipped over the overhead doors. There are 10 bay doors that are 14 by 16 feet. These doors are a little unique in that they don't open vertically. They slide open or more in accordion fashion. They're supposed to be the most energy efficient door on the market and they're also supposed to um, be quicker in closing and opening because we have radiant heat in the floor the quicker that the door is open and closed, the less heat you lose. So that's really why they were considered in this um, process. Um, electronic hardware, that's really a security factor that's come in the last few years because of what's happening in public buildings. It's really to control access in the lobby so that people can't just randomly uh, walk through the station. Um, aluminum glass, that's really a couple of just entries into the building. Uh, the drywall is obviously all the office spaces because they're wood frame. They're going to have drywall um, at the ceilings and at the walls. Um, there are areas that have acoustical ceilings, which are basically the panelized systems that you see in schools and a lot of public buildings. The flooring was very simple. It's VCT and some um, carpet tile in office spaces. There's nothing really extravagant as far as that goes. Uh, paint is paint basically the outside was all clad in vinyl so the only paint you're going to have is the interior of the building so painting of drywall surfaces exposed metal surfaces exposed block surfaces 
that are interior to the building. Uh, specialties, lockers, signage, and equipment are all really division type, almost furnishing type of things where we're providing lockers for the gear room. Um, signage is obviously just so that you can get around the building. Things are identified. There's also a site sign that's on the project. The building lettering on the building from the outside so that it's identifiable when you're pulling up to it. Um, Fire protection, plumbing, and HVAC, electrical, and generator are all MEP items, which they're basically your systems that control the air. As we said, the building in the bays is primarily heated through a radiant slab, which means tubes are heated with water, and they run through the slab to heat it to keep the heat down low rather than in a higher area where it's going to have a tendency to rise up. The rest of the building is really a simple fin tube system that's no different than you would find in most houses. Um, electrically, we're obviously all into LED lighting now, and there's a generator so that all the services can run if, if there's a power outage. The contingency in fee, anytime you're involved with a construction management project because you're not necessarily aware of everything that's involved with the project, like for instance, if you run into an unsuitable material below grade, that you'll have to deal with. That's what a contingency offers you the ability to cover those sort of things rather than having to reach out for additional funds. Our fee, we all know what our fee is, and then we carried a 2018 escalation. The market right now in construction is crazy. I mean, that's one of the reasons we didn't put this out to bid at this stage is because subcontractors are so busy. So what we are hoping to do is get through this end of the year period where people are just, they're exhausted and get into the beginning of the year and put it out to bid when they're really gonna be searching for work and we'd hopefully be able to pass more savings on to you from a competitive bidding standpoint. And then we have the owner soft cost, which I think Chief can get into, and the total project cost, which we came up with is 5469000 So one very important uh, point that I failed to make earlier about construction management is that um, the construction manager is responsible for providing what's called a guaranteed maximum price. Uh, so the, the cost figures, that total to the four, I guess I have it right in front of me here, roughly 4.8 million, um, which is, would be um, the contract with the construction manager, is a guaranteed maximum price. So if we don't need to use that 200,000 in contingency, that money goes 100% back to the town and the town can choose to do what they want with it. Um, so that gives you the benefit of knowing that you have some additional insurance built into this number, but also the benefit of knowing that, well, the, the, the risk is on the construction manager, frankly, and you benefit um, by any savings. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Troy uh, to talk a little bit about bond financing options. Okay, so if this project is approved by the voters, uh, unfortunately, we don't have $5.5 million laying around the general fund. We don't have any capital reserves that we can finance the project through. So we've been in contact with the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank, uh, working with them on, as you see behind me, uh, several different types of ways to finance this through the traditional bonding um, method. There is two different ways that you can bond, set up your bond. Uh, level principal. Level principal would be the principal is the same for the life of the, of the note. Uh, interest payments are higher um, at the start. They decrease over the life of the, of the note. Um, so essentially, the first year of payment for a level principal bond is the highest. Each year, it decreases over time. Uh, level debt is exactly that. The bond uh, repayment terms are structured so it's a, almost the same payment each year uh, for the life of the bond. Towns and schools use both methods um, of financing, really what works best for the community. 
Um, so for example, a lot of towns like to use the level principal because they'll take on that payment the initial year. They know that every year their debt payment's gonna decrease by a certain dollar amount, $25,000, $30,000 a year. So eventually, um, as the town has other capital projects, either school or town related, there is some growth there in the budget um, to take on that new debt or new capital projects. And at the same time, really trying to provide some stability to the tax rate. The level debt is another tool that's used and towns like to know that it's gonna be a certain dollar amount um, every year for the life of the note and they can plan their capital um, projects uh, around that fixed payment. The Board of Selectmen has not yet determined uh, what uh, the term of the note will be and what type of financing we would choose to go with. We just received the estimates right around Christmas so we're still um, looking at the possibility you know the different um, um, proposals. We're also aware that there is the opportunity to utilize private financing. We um, are aware that some towns have used um, companies that actually finance the lease purchase of their um, equipment and vehicles. And some of these companies will actually finance uh, fire stations. And we've been told that sometimes the interest rates can be very competitive. So we'll be looking at that. If the Warren article passes, it authorizes the Board of Selectmen to go out and negotiate the best um, interest rate and best you know, bonding or financing packages that we feel is in the best interest of the town. So looking at this, um, you, you're gonna see, for example, a homeowner that has a house that's assessed at about $300,000 with these um, different options you're looking at um, a high of possibly $177, $177 per year <laughs> um, to a low of $111 per year um, added on to your property tax. Um, so less than um, you know, a dollar uh, a day for um, your typical financing for this project. And with that, I think we're gonna We really didn't cover. So what I want to do before we actually get to the question and answer is uh, go back to the, we, we talked about everything but that $600,000 soft cost. And some of, the, some of the costs that are involved there are moving our radio and our communication system. Everything right now is at the, is at the fire station on, on Charles Bancroft. And it, when we move, uh, and it's off the antenna on the roof, and when we move, obviously we need to move that communications equipment with us. So about approximately 150,000 of that 679 is just to build the tower, the foundation, the tower, the antennas, and all the stuff to, to support moving the equipment we have. Then there's mo the moving the equipment costs. There's um, cost uh, within that is also furniture and fixtures. Right now, um, the only desk in the firehouse is mine. Everybody else works off kitchen counter type um, configurations. Uh, file cabinets, trash cans, um, that, that type of stuff, that's up to the town to supply. Um, so those figures are in there. And again, they're estimates um, and, and um, based on other projects that, that have, have been done and, uh, you know, and, and, and numbers that are used as a basic to furnish a typical office, uh, an amount of money type uh, figures. There's also money in there to move the uh, uh, diesel exhaust system that we installed in the current fire station uh, a little over, I guess, two years ago now. That system was, was designed, it was specced in order to be moved. It was actually a little bit overbuilt at the time so that when we do move it, um, it can handle the additional equipment. Um, however, it can't go from the current five trucks to 10 trucks um, without some kind of increase in pipe and, and, and so forth. So there's money in there to, to move the current primal vent or exhaust system as well as expand it as needed for, um, the, for the new facility. Uh, there's money to move equipment. While we can certainly um, move most of the stuff and, and so forth, as I mentioned earlier, the washer extractor, the, the large uh, SCBA compressor and the associated bottles and cascade system to go with it really need to be moved by um, 
properly trained or, or riggers, if you will, that are trained to move large pieces of, and heavy pieces of equipment like that. It's not something you go to U-Haul, grab a dolly, throw on a dolly, and muscle into the back of a pickup. It's just too big and too heavy. Um, that, those costs are in there. Um, also in there is the, the project cost provides for um, boxes and, and the piping and so forth for the cabling and the um, IT needs, but it doesn't necessarily provide for all of the IT components that we would be, we would be utilizing. Obviously, we have phones current. We have phones at the fire station, but we need to add a few phones given the, the increase in size. Those are the things that are in that. The other thing that's, that's in that is uh, an alerting system. And, and an alerting system basically is a speaker system set up so that no matter where we are in the fire station, shower, bays, wherever we are, we know that there's an emergency. Um, so it's basically like a, an intercom system that's purely dedicated to um, alerting us that there's an incident going on, at both audibly and visually. So that, those costs are not part of the actual construction. They're part of our, uh, what are referred to as our soft costs. Um, we certainly intend to uh, go after grants. However, there are unfortunately no grants, state, federal, or otherwise, to build or, or equip, uh, build really fire stations. There is some funding out there through Homeland Security grants to help cover the cost of the generator, that, the backup generator that will, will power the building in the, in the event of an outage. Uh, but those costs need to be in the project in order for us to secure the, uh, to apply for and secure the grant funding for those projects. Those, those type grants are typically matches, whether it's 20% match or 50% match, but those costs, we can utilize the cost of the building as our, our grant match. Uh, as well as the, the other grants that are out there through, again, different grant, but through the same Homeland Security, is funding to help um, chairs, tables, and the necessary equipment to um, equip the Emergency Operations Center so that in the event of a, a large-scale incident, that center is ready to go. There is funding out there for that. So there is money out there. Unfortunately, it's not, you know, 5 or $5.2 million worth of funding it's at probably at best 200,000 but we do intend to seek all grants that that we can in order to offset this but the costs do need to be in there in order to uh, be able to to do that to apply for the grants and with that I think we're ready for questions How you doing? Paul Pori at Chatfield Drive. I've got, yeah, I got a few questions. Um, I know some of you in the room. I'm a, uh, I'm a police chief in another community. And uh, presently, I'm actually going through uh, the same uh, scenario that you're going through right now. I've been working uh, with my board of selectmen, my uh, budget committee, my capital improvement committee for the past year and a half on, uh, on building a new uh, police department. And uh, during this endeavor, I've uh, had the opportunity to visit uh, many police stations throughout the state of New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, some of them being public safety buildings as well. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the places I visited uh, is a, a public safety complex in Farmington, New Hampshire. It was uh, actually, uh, they, they opened the doors about six months ago, and they hired a uh, contractor contracting company called Growing Construction. They're out of Rochester. And they've built a 19,000 square foot uh, public safety complex. The police side is about 7,000 square feet. And the remainder belongs to the uh, fire department, which is about 12,000 square feet. It's four bays. And uh, they spent $2.36 million on this building. And again, that was six months ago they opened the doors. I went there the day that they opened the uh, doors. I, uh, it was one of the buildings that I toured, and uh, we also decided to, uh, to go with this company as well. Uh, we put out an RFP. Uh, we got three bids from various uh, contractors. We interviewed them at length. We had public hearings like we're having here today. Um, 
So I'm just, I'm just wondering why uh, the price is, is so high for this particular building. And also, I don't see any sleeping quarters. So to give you a, a, a you can see it online if you go to Grow and Construction, look at their website. Uh, go to Farmington Public Safety Complex. You can see the building itself. And uh, they've actually got sleeping quarters. They've got eight bays. It's a beautifully designed building. And uh, it's all energy efficient as well. Um, they use I ICF construction. Um, I, they've got some solar there. So I guess one of my questions is, are you going to put out an RFP on this, this, this proposed fire department? The, I, I think as far as the actual cost, they will be bid once the project is approved. I'm, I'm not, as far as the, the town, what the town did was Warren Street had the projects. The, the Board of Selectmen utilized the existing plans, as, as Jonathan indicated earlier. Uh, we did put out uh, an RF, RFP, correct, John, for, for an RFP for the construction managers. We received six uh, construction management companies that expressed interest. Uh, we went through a scoring process, um, scored them, and then chose to interview the top four companies that had, had uh, submitted an RFP. We actually included... Uh, uh, three members of the community, chairman of the planning board at the time, um, uh, and, and two other members uh, to conduct those interviews with us, and then through process of scoring, selected Ekman as the construction management company. Okay, I think as a John, John said he's he had a design back in 2004, yep. and all he did was kind of retrofit it so that it fits today's standards. Is is that right? Yeah, yes, but with some growth for the bays, because the original design was three bays, because of a, it was a proposed substation or second station, where this is going to be the only station, and then some 1,000 some feet to accommodate current changes in standards for okay. storage of gear and, and so forth. I mean, I just think, you know, through my experience, 32 years in law enforcement, and having, you know, gone through this myself, and now living in this town, I've been here 26 years as a taxpayer, I think we have to look at some alternative, maybe contractors here. Um, and I would, I, would, I would urge anybody in this room that's thinking about voting for this police department, I mean this fire department, and believe me, I'm in support of a fire department. You guys need a fire department. Um, a two and a half million dollar, three million dollar, absolutely. But a five and a half million dollar, based on what I know and what I've seen today, I think you can. I, can, I think you can do better than this, and I'd support something that that was more, more in that realm. Um, another thing I want to look at. So I I, I don't really want to. Uh, you're, you're the fire chief. You know what's best for, for the fire department. But just one question I had, would you have the decon shower inside the building. Well, it's kind of, you said that there's a separate area, but you're still coming inside the building. So if, if you've got carfentanil or uh, meth or, or some other substance on your body or in your suits, you're going to be taking that literally inside the building. Why wouldn't the decon shower be a separate outside, outside the outside of the area of the uh, interior of the building so that, that there's two showers there's the locker room showers yep and then there is the decon shower which is right in this area here so it's immediately off of the apparatus bay so it's not getting whatever that individual may have on them is not going into the clean area or clean administrative area so they would they would do a shower you know, throw on a Tyvek suit or whatever, and then once cleaned, once, go into the locker room, take a second shower, and then change into their necessary clothing. I understand that. I understand that. But I guess my concern would be same thing when you go into a, uh, a residence where they're making methamphetamine. 
the dangers of the methamphetamine. It's getting on your suits, getting on your clothing. You're literally bringing that into, into your home, into the garage, into the garage area, and then into partially, really, re realistically, into the building. I would think you would have a decon separate outside, a separate outside area. But I mean, that's something. That's no, something I, for you I, guys I, to I'm decide. Following. You know, I mean, it, and is there a decon? Is there a water separate? dirty water tank because I, I know that they can get real expensive those those tanks and those pump systems you got to keep it separate from so to, that's two questions going back to the first one yeah um, in the scenario you you proposed yeah decon would actually be done before we ever left the incident right so once it's established that it's a, a meth lab or a hazardous materials incident by standard procedure we would do the 90% the of the decon there and then this would be a second and potentially third shower in a matter of a short period of time. So they would not come back into the, they would not get back on the truck if they were knowingly contaminated. They'd be deconned right there on site. Okay. So I, I may not have cleared. Uh, to your second question, yep. uh, Mr. Poirier, uh, yes, there is um, uh, separate uh, retention, for lack tank. of a better term, septic tanks yep. for the contaminated. Water. What about, have we, have we considered any energy efficient materials, ICF, solar, anything like that? that factored in, John? The building is not ICF. Okay. There is, there is uh, structure is planned, the roof is planned to accommodate solar. That conversation has not been had with the town in terms of purchase or lease of that system. But the envelope of the building and the systems of the building could be certified as a, as a LEED building. Our buildings are all baseline energy efficient. So uh, you know, I could go through the different elements, but. Okay. I, I guess. Um one last thing. I know that there's been there's been some talk about adding an addition to this, and uh, having some spare room that way. If we move the police department out of the uh, um, where it's at now with town hall. If if you look at the plan for the Farmington Police Department, and this company growing, uh, built the Pelham Police Department. They built the Portsmouth Police Department. Uh, I mean, not police department, fire departments. Excuse me, the fire department in Pelham and the fire department in Portsmouth. Um, and they recently built the Farmington. So if you look at this, uh, there's, that facility is 19,000 square feet, houses police, fire, ambulance. Um, it's, it's two stories. It's got an upstairs sleeping quarters for both fire and police. They share it with the police department as well. Again, it's $2.36 million. The only thing that I ask as a, as a taxpayer is that the select board, the fire, fire chief, and, and, I, and I'm sure you can call the fire chief over there, they love showing off the building. Go take a look at it. Uh, you can put something like that here in town. I'd be absolutely more, will, more than willing to vote for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Jen Burke, 1 Westview Drive. Just curious for the Board of Selectmen, who was the nay vote and why? Pretend you go to a car dealership and you have your mind set on buying a $30,000 car and you like it, you love it, they're going to deliver it. You go to the financing table and all of a sudden they tell you, nope, that $30,000 car is $55,000 now. We were told all the way up until December 29th that this was going to be about a $3 million building. Um, December 29th, I got, a, I, I got an email or text message that explained that, oh, it's going to be $5.5 million. I would love to get it back down to $3 million. That's why I voted against it. I don't think that we can afford a $5.5 million building. And people will ask me, why do you think that, or, or, or what would you cut? Well, I'm not an expert. That's their job. They need to learn or try to figure out how to cut a couple million dollars out of the price. So that's why I voted against it. Thank you. You're welcome.
Chris Pascucci, 12 Colonial Drive. Uh, I, I don't know who that uh, board member is, but I want to applaud you because you're really looking out for the taxpayers and their, and their money because you're right. Uh, if you do just the, if I did the basic math properly it's over four hundred and thirty dollars a square foot if you take out the soft costs and the, some furniture and fixtures it's three hundred and eighty dollars a square foot anybody in construction real estate property management just a gut feeling says that's a lot of money it is a lot of money um, but there is also another issue um, that I want to it, it was asked by uh, uh, earlier and uh, it hasn't been answered yet what is the reason why um, the other building would remain standing and not be knocked down as part of this deal, being that we've heard for many years as the uh, rationale for this is the building is in such poor shape, the parking lot is horrible, the drainage is horrible, it needs tons of maintenance. We've just heard there's asbestos in there, uh, there's support beams that are, that are in bad shape. Nothing about the building is good. It was built by volunteers, and there's been a lot of additions. But yet, um, the selectmen are going to allow it to remain standing and not be knocked down. What's the reason for that? I will let the selectmen answer. Chris, there has been no uh, decision made on that building yet. Um, we're taking input. As a matter of fact, that we're meeting with other uh, town officials um, as we speak on an ongoing basis, the chair of the budget committee, the superintendent of schools, and to see if, if there was a feasible use for the building before we were to make a decision just to level it. I don't disagree with you uh, personally, um, but I, I think that will be something that we'll be talking about very soon. Um, if it is the will of the, um, the body, to uh, level that building it certainly makes sense then uh, instead of putting money into a building that does not meet code or anything um, I think it's something the board will seriously listen to um, but that will be um, decided shortly so as mr. Lambert brought up earlier there are people talking about that and right. um, it, it is a very large issue yep. it might not be a lot of money in the big scheme of things but the building has a lot of issues and you know anybody sitting on this end knows if uh, the demolition of that is not part of the deal to build a new fire station it will be a town asset and in my opinion a detriment for a long time to come so it, it needs to be part of the deal if you want to increase your chances of getting a, a yes vote on this fire station this has to be part of it because nobody wants to risk the chance that we vote in a fire station and then the discussion happens about what to do with the fire station because we all know that from the selectmen and and everybody around everybody's going to want dibs on that building and it will remain and then therefore the decision will be at the next town meeting not whether it stays or goes it's going to be do we spend a lot of money or a hell of a lot of money right. to, to retrofit it and make it where it's supposed to be so that needs to be part of this deal when the fire station is complete a wrecking ball needs to go to that building point well taken thank you I'm, uh, I'm not really sure what the bone of contention is with tearing down the fire department that's, that's there now. How many, I guess, apparatus can we fit in there now? In the current building? Yes. It's five. So I, I would propose as a taxpayer that, that we, we leave it there and we put the least necessary uh, vehicles that we're going to use the lease, leave it as a storage garage and that way we could cut down on the bays that we have up there. Instead of having 10 bays, we have eight. Um, so we don't have to have certain apparatus that's not used that frequently. There's maybe the stuff that we have stored at the highway department, maybe we keep that stuff down at the, at the station that's there now. Who knows, maybe someday we'll resurrect it. George Lambert, Three Lidston Lane. When I was a member of the Board of Selectmen, I got to work with the Cable Committee. And they have a little building right next to your fire department. And I don't know if things have changed, but they have a lovely studio on the second floor. Fantastic asset we spent a bunch of money on that we can't use 
because we hadn't actually worked out all the details and so it wasn't in compliance. Right now, we have a building that we've been hearing is not in compliance that is got structural problems that has asbestos. There are a number of resources for going out and looking for money to clean that up. We should be sitting there and focusing on getting a new fire station and making sure that we don't have that tax liability and that potential liability to this community. Because if the fire department were to go out and say, we have this other building over here that's full of asbestos, you'd want somebody to clean it up. Any other questions? And actually, Mr. Lambert made a good point. The uh, cable building was where we actually have conducted our training for the past several years. Uh, that was just turned completely into a studio, uh, at which point we lost our, our only indoor training, classroom type training. Uh, the church has been very gracious next door and allowed us use of their, uh, the basement of the church for the three nights a month that we do our indoor training so that we actually don't have a spot in the current station we can bring everybody in to do training. We have to find an outside uh, location. So, sir. Hi, I'm Mark Vandendijk on Moose Hollow Road. I heard you talking about some of the uh, office space used there and you mentioned counseling firefighters positively and hopefully not negatively. Um, could you go over some of the office space in there? I mean, I'd there's a multi-purpose room, there's some smaller offices. I just, I mean, explain how some of this is not redundant and maybe you don't need as many spaces to do as much as you need. I mean, a special room for counseling people. I, I don't know if I heard that right. Um, so, so that room would be for completing report, incident reports after an incident that it would be, well, I apologize for stepping this, this, ar this area right here that, that's labeled officers corner, officers center. Thank you. Um, that would basically be where um, incident reporting gets completed, um, payroll and stuff like that gets completed during or after each incident. Uh, it also could be used for a very small meeting. Uh, it would be shared by upwards of five people. Not at every, not all at once, but utilized very similar to the way we use our, um, our upstairs right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Frank Byron, 8 Mallard Court. I'd like to ask a question of the engineering group. I'm wondering if they could provide us an overview of the comparative buildings that they had in terms of cost per square foot and to total building costs that they used uh, when they came up with the costs of this and then compared them to other buildings that were built in the, um, say, state of New Hampshire. I'm not sure if I qualify as the engineering group, but we were the construction manager. I think that was. That'll do. Yeah. So um, the first thing I'll say is that it is very difficult to, to compare cost per square foot from one fire station to another. Um, there are a lot of factors that contribute. Site work is almost always completely different from one site to another. Um, the systems, as you saw from the chief, there's a lot of technical components that go into these stations. I can't speak to what a station in Farmington has in a design any more than a station in Londonderry that's being proposed. These aren't stations that, that we've done. Um, I'd be interested in seeing the plans and the specifications and, and the costs and we could comment on those perhaps. Um, the other factor that influences costs dramatically, especially in the last 10 years, is the cost of construction. Um, so a project that bid even just two years ago, you, you can't build for the same price today. Um, that being said, we did uh, complete a project in Milton, New Hampshire, a fire station in, in Milton. I don't have all of the cost breakout, but I, I did just make myself a, a quick note. Uh, this was a project that bid in 2015. Um, it's a 9,000 square foot station and including site, uh, building and site, 
it was around $280 a square foot. If you were to take a 4% escalation per year to today, that's around $315 a square foot. Um, co to compare that to what is construction costs that have been presented tonight, uh, those are $360 a square foot. So 315, 360, you can see where variances in site, variances in mechanical systems, electrical systems, um, existing conditions, and, and other functional uh, necessities that are specific to those two different departments could add plus or minus $40,000 or $40 a square foot. Um, and we're also doing uh, a project in Plastow currently. Um, project manager from the Plastow project is here, Matt Walsh. Um, that is an addition and renovation project. It's a uh, eight and a half million dollar overall total project cost. Uh, it's a police station addition and a renovation of the existing public safety building. Impossible to compare cost per square foot there, right? It's, you have an existing building, we're doing, we have existing systems, we're doing, you know, renovations in some areas and other areas not. Some areas we're keeping apparatus base, other areas we're completely reconfiguring space. And, um, and then there's another, you know, portion that's completely new. Some of the site's getting affected, some of it isn't. So I guess um, my, my word of caution in, in talking about cost per square foot figures is that they are dangerous without having all of the knowledge. And, um, you know, I think you can tell from our explanation of the process methodology we went through in arriving at the costs and the description of the design that we do not start at the 10,000 foot level. We start at the micro level and, and build up from there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, please, uh, if, if there's other information that's available from other projects that you would like us to review and comment on and, and how, how it compares, we would be happy to do so. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, we're really not in a position to comment further. So before I retired, I was one of the people who was responsible for putting up some of the largest biotech plants in the, in the world. And we always commonly did cost per square foot compared to other facilities, as well as comparison costs for total facilities, all of that type of stuff. It is possible to be done. And I would appreciate if we could have some type of report so when we get to the um, further discussion on this project that we could have those costs. I don't think it's appropriate for you to ask me to go and get the cost to do that. I would think that the selectmen, as well as you as the project engineers or project managers, I should say, should come forward with those costs and be able to put them up there. I do know that there's going to be caveats involved in that, and I think you could easily take and kind to smooth those out. Thank you. Good evening, Bob Keating, 20 Center Street. Uh, you talk about the addition to this as far as putting a police station on. Do we have any ballpark numbers for that? I don't. I, I know the police department has started to look at feasibility studies and so forth, but I, I don't know where they're at. I did. I just did a quick look. Uh, I'm also in law enforcement 20 years uh, in the city, been through a new building. Uh, we're a part of it. I think a town like this, um, splitting things up, we have an opportunity to do it right with the safety complex. You look at a place like Farmington that I was looking at at 4 a.m. this morning, so uh, don't ask me for the uh, particulars of that. Uh, Bo came in, 4.9 million safety complex. I know Plastel is a design build, so that's going to be a little bit different because you're doing the additional stuff. I just think this price tag is just way too big for a single fire department. Uh, I think if it was attached with both, I'd be uh, more than happy to do that. I think we have an opportunity to do it right here in town um, because I don't see the taxpayers in town having the stomach for a $5.5 million bond and then say another $5 million in three or four years when we have the opportunity to do it right. Thank you. We just got a, a commitment from uh, Grown Construction on a, a 5,000 square foot uh, police facility. And it's 
it came out at nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars so you figure out the square foot, uh, what it costs per square foot there for a police facility five thousand square feet I think it's about 275 a square foot and, uh, and, and on a side note to that uh, the three contractors all came in between 245 and 275 per square foot Any other questions? Thank you all. Hearing um, or seeing that there's no more um, residents that wish to speak, I will close the public hearing or the bond hearing. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we'll see you at deliberative session.